It's episode 311 of The Platformers, a show about games and nerd culture, and I am your host, Brian Barnett. And I am a vocal needless Chris Cornelise. And I'm Lucas White, and I have never been more on my bullshit than I am this week. Hey. Hell yeah. We got a lot to talk about, but I just want to start by saying... Have you seen those flipping Dodgers lately? Oh my god. <laughs> this sounds like a sports ball thing. Is this a sports ball thing? I it's, don't know sports ball. It's a sports ball Especially thing. Especially not American sports ball. Yeah. I should clarify. I don't know American sports ball. I am only I vaguely really aware of fine. Australian, so. Yeah. Anyways, I've been getting really into... I. So, for a long time, we've been talking about how, like... Or I've been talking about, I don't, you know, I'm not going to project on anybody else. I've been talking about how I want to have like better balance in my life and doing a bunch of different things. And now I feel mm. like I really, I kind of have it. I've been taking more time to go on like long walks almost every day. Uh, I've been taking my daughter out for bike rides. I've been, uh, I've been wanting to get more into sports for a long time and I've finally done it. I'm listening to a bunch of audio books which is great. And also, you know, reading other books. Um, and I feel like I'm in like a really fun rhythm, like watching TV and movies at night, playing games, enjoying my steam deck, which we will also get into, uh, for a little bit, but I've really, uh, enjoyed fitting these little things, uh, in where I have time, you know, uh, and I highly recommend, uh, one of the things that I think is the most uh, imposing about sports is just how long it takes to watch a game. And mm-hmm. and I will say, like, I, I've watched tons of games. I've gone to baseball uh, uh, stadiums and arenas and stuff like that, like, tons of times. I've seen football games. I've seen all kinds of stuff. I've been to hockey games. I've played several of these sports, including, like, I mean, I guess you could see over in the corner that there's a little picture of me on my football team. Uh, oh, yeah. but, uh, I was like, I really want to watch more Dodgers games and I just don't flip and have the time. And did you find highlight reels? Yes, I did. Yeah. That's how you do it. That's how you do it. Ooh. And now I'm, I'm like, I'm watching the, the best bits from like every game and it takes like seven to 10 minutes a day. And I'm like, bro, that is way better than like three to five hours. That yeah. Is- that's, that's how I keep up with. Like I watch tennis tournaments on occasion, like most of the big grand slams, just um, a friend got me into them and I'm like, yeah, this is kind of cool. So yeah, I won't sit down and watch the full games to the extent because, you know, men's finals go into like five sets and takes like six hours. It's ridiculous. But yeah, yeah, I'll watch some of those when it's like a really interesting match and it's somebody I'm following. But other than that, it's just like highlight reels. Highlight reels are the way to do it. Yeah, I love it, dude. Like, I really look forward to and because and the funny thing is I tried to do this with the 49ers, but uh, I, ju- I found myself being like, I don't think this really works. But baseball really does work in that format uh, because a lot of it is set up. A lot of it is like switching stuff like that, like football is that way as well. But like the, the push and pull kind of tells a story that you don't get when you just watch the highlights of a football game. But with baseball, like you see it, it's like, okay, the bases are loaded. This person's stepping up to the plate. Like what's going to happen? You know, you also get like, I don't know. It's, it's, it feels like it's way easier to boil down into that, uh, format. And so I've, I've been loving it. It's been great. And it was, the Dodgers were in kind of an itchy, uh, iffy, situation earlier this season but now they've just kind of been on a tear like they 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 did and i i didn't want to mention this to ryan mccaffrey because i know that he's into baseball as well but he was rooting for the diamondbacks and early uh the dodgers versus diamondbacks was going like pretty even and then the dodgers just like pulled away with it like just it got got more and more lopsided as as their like three game set went on but uh yeah it's been great uh, you know, watching them versus the Mets and the Nationals and then the Diamondbacks and now the Braves, uh, which is funny because apparently like the, the Braves and the Dodgers are my 
wife's least favorite teams because they're always stomping on the Astros. <laughs> but uh, anyways, I've been having a lot of fun with that. So I wanted to I wanted to advocate for that. Like if you feel like you don't have enough time to watch sports and you want to get into Highlight it, reels. I highly recommend it. The MLB puts them together themselves and they've got really good commentary on them. They're on YouTube. You can watch them for free. It's super easy. They go up like every day because there's they play tons of games. So yeah, it's awesome. Anyways, I, I enjoy it. We got a really great, we got two really great pitchers. We got a bunch of good batters. One of the guys on our team is named Will Smith. That's that's just, you know, that's, that's fun. That's how it is. Yeah, the, the closest I get to understanding baseball is uh, doing the Like a Dragon mini games. So, you know. Yeah. Baseball big, big in Japan. Thing. Big in Japan, We've huge got, in Japan. Hence got, why they it, it affects the plots in some of the earlier uh, Like a Dragon games. It's it's the, amazing. The Dodgers have two they Japanese accurately players. predicted massive scandals. Yeah, like, it was amazing. That's pretty astonishing. Yeah, the the Dodgers themselves have two really great Japanese players, uh, including like one of the best hitters in the league right now, who just overtook uh, Matsui to have the highest home run count ever for a Japanese born player in the MLB. He's like Dang. over, a, he's like over 108. He's closing in on like 190, 200 home runs now. Uh, and, uh, and we've got a really awesome pitcher. I forget his name, Yashimoto, something like that. I forget his name, but he's really good as well. But anyways, I'm not here to talk about a bunch of sports ball, but I just did want to say I've really been enjoying that. That's part of what I've been getting up to and being able to watch that, pop that up on YouTube on this, on the, on the TV and then like have my steam deck in my lap has just been forget about it, man. It's been great. Yeah. Steam deck coming in strong for you right then. On. I, I have to say I am astonished because it is like a full 180 based on my experience with the steam deck at first versus how I feel about it now. And I don't know whether that's because it's the base model versus the OLED or or whether it's how it the state in which the software and everything launched originally versus now versus just what I need it to do and what I'm expecting of it now versus when I originally did it or some amalgamation of all three of those things but I, like I'm legitimately getting to the point where I'm like I I'm trying to think of a better like tech purchase that I've made and other than like the the very first time I bought a laptop I can't think of anything really that has like just totally changed the way that I do things in like a really fun way. Like I keep, I keep having an aside to Audrey to be like, thank you. Like I'm really, I am just loving this. You know, I'm finding new ways to do it. I got the heroic games store up on there. I started playing some oh, epic yeah. stuff. I Tetris effect connected on there. Super awesome. It's great to have like the Epic games now that I'm like, I'm, I've been redeeming all the free ones. So it's just like, okay. So like that, what is it? 20 minutes to yeah, midnight? It's a free library, yeah. Whatever. Like I've got a bunch of these games. I've got Death Stranding on there, which I have not tried yet. But the thing that shocked me is that I was just like, uh, let's just see. This isn't going to work, but I'm just going to see. I installed Cyberpunk on there and it runs beautifully. What now is happening? You to play it. You're going to have to play it now. As you yeah, said. I, I loaded it up and I started playing it and it like was kind of chugging a little bit. And so I went into the image settings and it was on low and I was like, huh? So I went to the left one and it, it went to a steam deck setting. It literally went like high, oh, cool. like medium, low steam deck. And I clicked on steam deck and it started running fucking fluid as shit. And I was like, <laughs> damn, like what? How did these sorcerers do this? <laughs> this isn't even on steam. How does it run I'd be, like that? Like, I'd be especially curious to know because the hardest thing Cyberpunk has in terms of like processing and everything is that when you're driving really fast, it'll just sometimes like, I can't keep up with this. And so bits and pieces will just not load. Vehicles will just vanish, basically. It's like, we're not processing vehicles because we can't load them in fast enough for you. And it's like, all right, cool. Yeah. And I'm, uh, still, that, I'm still in the very early intro. Um, I'm doing like, yeah, the, you, you want to be able to properly test that for at least a little bit. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. But I'm very surprised that it looks this good and runs this well 
like this. I'm just like, but it, it is the, uh, so I've had, I've had a problem for a long time, which is there's too many games that I want to play and there's so many limited ways in which I can play them. So like if I want to play a certain game and I don't feel it's like, it's like persona three reload where it's just like, I have this on PC. I really don't feel like playing this sitting at my desk and it's kind of involved to I set up my gaming laptop. It, yeah. And so I really didn't want to do that either. And because I'm, I'm trying to catch up to where I originally was in my original playthrough of Persona 3, uh, the portable version, I'm trying to see everything. So I'm actually following like a, a guide on that game. Uh, mm-hmm. Max social link guide. Kind yeah, of thing. exactly. Yeah. So that I can just kind of like see everything and do everything. Um, that's what I did in, in Persona 4 five when I played it the second time to go for the platinum or whatever. Um, or maybe I did that just straight off the bat. I just went for the platinum and I just got it without doing it. Anyways, regardless. So I've been doing that and now the Persona 3 Reload runs beautifully on the Steam Deck. And it's, so it's like, okay, that problem is solved. You know, where am I going to play Cyberpunk? I really don't feel like sitting down at night in front of my computer again. Cyberpunk runs beautifully on the Steam Deck. Problem solved. Now there's another one over there. And then it's just like, Baldur's Gate 3 runs beautifully on there. And so I'm like, okay, do I want to finish my Dark Urge playthrough on there? And the answer is yes. And then it's just like, okay, and Bellatro, I'm like 200 plus hours into, and I don't want to stop playing that because it's incredible. And I can also play Guilty Gear on that, and I can also play Grand Blue on that. And it's just like, or I don't I don't know if I can play Grand Blue. I can play Street Fighter on that, and Akuma's coming out soon, so like I'm wanting to do that. The, the problems that I've had have been like everything scattered to the winds and I want to play a lot of stuff, but I'm just not going to get to it because I don't feel like dealing with the limitations that they have. You know, I don't feel hmm. like sitting front in front of the television to play Final Fantasy VII Rebirth or my daughter wants to watch something on the television or my wife wants to watch something on the television. And now I set up Chiaki for Deck. So it's like I can keep playing Final Fantasy VII Rebirth by streaming to my Steam Deck and it's beautiful. So it's no longer a problem of being able to access something in a way that's comfortable. It's now a problem of, okay, all of those barriers have been eliminated. Now I just actually have to play all these games. Now yeah. comes the tricky part, the time management. Yes. And, but you know, now I'm, you know, I've been doing work, but I'm in a bit of a, of a, of a, uh, of a break from work. I'm spending more time doing stuff at home. So I do have that time. So now really the only barrier is can I tear myself away from the final like five achievements that I have in Bellatro in order to actually do something else? And I feel like the answer <laughs> is almost yes. You know, almost, almost yes. But anyways. All I believe say, you billions wouldn't. Yeah. I, I believe I it's I mean it's it's an incredible game. Uh but yeah, it's it's awesome. It's awesome. So between between that, between listening to audiobooks and reading books and playing on the Steam Deck and going out and being more active and watching sports, I'm in a really good place. And uh, let me pass it over to somebody else because I've been I've been yammering away for quite some time. Cyberpunk thing is funny because it reminds me of uh, day one when everything was terrible. <laughs> yeah. The the undisputed best way to play cyberpunk was on Google Stadia. <laughs> yes. Which, you know, wasn't good. But it yeah, didn't have it was just know, like just it wasn't going to end up in a more stable, yeah. And then now here it is with its like weird little bespoke Steam Deck settings. Yeah. Where, it's great. What a fascinating game historically. What a turnaround, yeah. It's wild, yeah. It's it's it is interesting. It has the luxury that a lot of games don't in that when it released and was utterly broken, the problem was the underlying foundation, the presentation, the story, the writing was all really good. There was something really good there for people to latch onto even when it was broken. So now that it's been polished up, it that's allowed it to shine even brighter and people are like, "Oh damn, this is awesome." Yeah. It didn't need to be fully rebuilt and you know remade from the ground up, basically like No Man's Sky or Final Fantasy XIV did. So it was able to have a, a smoother arc to redemption than a lot of the others would have. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. <sighs> Anyways, that's much like Helldivers yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, should we, should we talk about that before we move on? I feel like we at least have to touch on it just because it's kind of dominated the memes of the last couple of days. But give give an elevator. I mean, there's a couple other things that have been dominating Twitter and social media for the past couple of days, but (laughs) that's a bit of a can of worms. Uh, But I I, I don't want to face the wrath of Kendrick. I'll just put it that way. (laughs) Uh, I mean, I, I, bro, I'm on his side for real. Like, oh, I've been, 100%. I've been anti Drake for like years and years and years and years. But, anyways, Chris, give us the elevator uh, elevator pitch TLDR uh, of what's going on with Helldivers. Okay, so Helldivers 2, uh, obviously released on PC, PS5, all that stuff. But for PC, it had the uh, the situation where it's like, hey, we would like you to link your PSN account at some point, but on release, they're like, we just want people to play it, so we're not going to mandate that just yet. It is an option. You can do that. Whatever. And and as just of, as a quick aside, it did enable you to do cross-play, which is the yes. reason why I did that like straight away, because I knew a lot of people who were playing it on PS5 specifically. Yeah, and so that allowed the cross-play. Obviously, big deal, but like fine with that. Uh, then last week, the, f- the Switch got flipped. And Sony made it clear that, hey, by the way, you absolutely have to have PSN now. We are not taking no for an answer. You have to link your accounts in order to continue playing. Here's the problem. PSN is available in 69, nice, countries only. There's a lot more than 69 countries in the world, and plenty of them have been playing Helldivers just fine this entire time, including a whole mm. bunch of uh, people I know, a few in various parts of Eastern Europe, parts of you know China can't play it anymore, that kind of thing. So had this rolled out, it would have denied a lot of people, and it still would have put many more through the rigors of actually trying to get the accounts running, and you know even if they never had a Sony account or anything like that. So just a real hassle and a real blemish and, you know, getting in the way of the game, which had done gangbusters is the best thing Sony has put out in a while. So naturally, uh, as the Helldivers 2 community is wont to do, they deployed the meme game on it. And boy, did it get memed. But uh, it also got review bombed. So as of late, if you take a look at the Helldivers 2 thing, it went to mostly negative for a while which is wild given that game is you know great and beloved and yeah so as of i want to say yesterday it was sony actually backed down they said cool we hear you we will hold off on doing that update for now not saying we're not going to do the update not said we're not going to continue to push this in some way just holding off for now so uh you know corporate speak for we still want all your bullshit we still want all yeah. of your money somehow, even if what we're doing will only deny us money. But is it, didn't Steam already start delisting it in some regions? Uh, yeah, they they started delisting it in multiple areas themselves. Uh, yeah. So yeah. What a what a weird what a weird thing to do to your own self. <laughs> Take yep. one of the biggest, most surprising W's of the year and turn it into a massive L. Only Sony could pull that off. It's true. It's true. Truly wild. And yeah, and again, got to defend Arrowhead's devs here. For the most part, they were fully against this. We're encouraging people to review bomb and to get on socials and do all that because they're like, yep. And to the point that. that they actually said, yeah, look, go ahead, leave negative reviews or whatever. It's the best way to get through. They don't read, Sony will not read the Discord. So hit them, you know, where it hurts in that regard. Hmm. And they went into bat for it on behalf of the community and everything saying, hey, this is a bad idea the um, lead dev or whatever came out and, you know, said, yeah, I, I accept that I didn't know as much of this when possible, but I'm fighting to fix all this. And yeah, so Arrowhead have been transparent and really good about it. They've been on the community side, full props to them. This is a publisher thing. And to the point where (laughs) they just unveiled the fact that there will be a new cosmetic in game with a cloak, which has a bunch of red, bars (laughs) bars <laughs> descending to highlight in the exact same shape funnily enough as all the review bombing on steam funny that incredible very nice absolutely amazing the hell divers devs remain undefeated <laughs> <laughs> except joe fuck joe hey i he, he uh, heavy if you know crown. you know <laughs> yeah 
Fuck Joel for the automatons. The rest of Joel's doings, I'm fine with. <laughs> they don't need any don't, goddamn help, bro. I don't know, man. That sounds like treason. It does sound like treason. Hold on, I'm gonna turn myself into my to my nearest democracy officer, as he rightly should, for Super Earth. For Super Earth. All right. God, that's what a game. <laughs> so good. Okay. So I guess I can go next. Um, go for it. So since last time we recorded, the uh, embargo lifted on a game that. I've been looking forward to since it was announced um, and would still be screaming about it if it wasn't for the fact that I got busy with work again. Um, but I had been playing the bejesus out of Saga Emerald Beyond. I've definitely uh, been looking forward to talking to you about this. So. Yeah, it is, it is the latest in a series that's been going on since the Game Boy, uh, led by a guy who has been the director of the series since the Game Boy. Um, and this game kind of feels like a culmination of like every idea, uh, he and his team have come up with since then. So um, better and worse. Hi, my dad. Yeah. Which makes it both like really incredible for me and also really hard to recommend depending on who I'm talking to. Um, it's also really hard to like figure out how to start talking about it. Um, so I will do my best. So basically, uh, saga games are like, if you, if you took a final fantasy and you sort of like ripped it inside out. So all it's like guts were hanging out everywhere, but all the like pretty parts are tucked away on the inside instead. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think that's the kind of the best metaphor i've been able to come up with especially for the latest one which you know i get what they're going for visually but god it's ugly it's actually ugly it's really off-putting um basically like what that means is the people making these games have i think from the beginning have been really interested in like what does it mean to try to make a video game version of a tabletop rpg it's like everyone else kind of settled on the Final Fantasy model. Um, but these guys are like, well, we're just kind of tinkering around the Game Boy and we got kicked off Final Fantasy. So let's, you know, let's let's try some different stuff. Um, and so they went very uh, famously, systems heavy. Yeah, very systems heavy. Uh, famously, the director was combat designer on Final Fantasy 2, which is often mm. the like, quote unquote, black sheep of the series for similar reasons. The progression's kind of more obtuse than the usual like yeah. getting exp points leveling up getting your skills on the map blah 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 uh this one's like you participate in battle uh you might get some stats uh your skills are going to go up based on what equipment you have or what spells you're using yada yada it's very like participatory but also like kind of random at the same time um and that's kind of evolved and changed over time. They've gotten more experimental with it. Uh, they've gotten more experimental with like having different like protagonists or having like the the whole like structure of how the actual like game world works. Um, most recently, they've kind of almost made it look like a board game that's like on a pop up book. So they've taken like the idea of if you're playing a tabletop RPG, you kind of move from piece to piece and there's not really a lot of like in a more cinematic RPG where you're running around and you're, you're going from town to town and everything's cinematic and everything, but in a tabletop, you're just kind of talking to each other and you're not really, you know, all, all the, all the connective tissue, you just kind of fill in your head basically. Um, so this is kind of like, what if we, represented that visually stripped out all the bells and whistles and just kind of made everything just like really like like modular in a sense um, very very plain very lacking in individual details it only focuses on the very important stuff that is immediately yeah. relevant and then everything else is like leave it up to your imagination pretty much yeah you're like you're like your character is like a 3d model you're running around in basically a 2d plane and um 
I don't think it's the case in Emerald Beyond, but the game right before it, where they were really coming into this style, like the locations and stuff would literally like pop up like pieces of cardboard. That's cool. Um, yeah. Um, so in this game, right, let me back up a step. So in the previous game, it was fairly straightforward in the sense that it was like, here's your map. You can run around and explore and go spot to spot and kind of uh, you would stumble over like event flags and scenarios just kind of uh, not quite randomly, but it's like, oh, what's in this place? Something? Yes, no, maybe, no, maybe I kick off a chain of events. Maybe I don't. There's nothing going on here so on and so forth. Um, this one's like, okay, what if we still kind of kept this style but made it more direct? So they kind of have this like system where you can look at like literal threads where it'll be like you can go here or here or here and there's no like uh yeah you can't explore anywhere else besides even places you've been to yeah. it's like no nah, they're just empty you can see them but that's it you can only go yeah. to where the threads go so it's yeah. almost like hyper linear in a way even though it's yeah you know, it does branch in places yeah that's and to like and to like sort of i was just gonna say that reminds me of some of the most frustrating mm. parts of final fantasy 7 rebirth where it's just like this is ostensibly an open world game, but if you walk anywhere other than in the one direction they want you to go, they're like warning and they pop up a little square and it's like, bro, like, come on. Mm, yeah. Kind of. Yeah. And, and in this game, like they kind of make up for it where like, you know, we're We're going to control where you can go in the moment, but the whole premise is like a multiverse thing where it's like you, you, you're in this like weird cosmic space and there's doors and you pick a door and that door is an entirely different world with like its own little scenario. So almost like a, a anthology style story. Is where it... there's like there's sort of like an overarching mystery, um, but really you're you're kind of like, well, what's behind this door? And it's like its own story, and then you leave, and then you go to the next door, and its own story, and then you leave. Is it? Um, um, is it like? Is it another story in the same way that like all of Lovecraft's stories take place within like the same shared universe? Or is it like each door is a different story in the way that like every Final Fantasy has kind of similar elements, but that the rules are like totally different? Think of it's it more almost... like Doctor Who. It's the one character yeah, in okay. different scenarios and places and you know, gotcha. sometimes yeah. Gotcha. So like all of it happened or is happening and it's just telling you these stories in a different order yeah. or something. Okay. Yeah. It's gotcha. like you, you literally, you open the door and it's an entirely different world. And the character goes uh, into this world and, and they may get involved. They may not, it may be yeah. elaborate. It may not, but yeah. the one character is still there and they might ostensibly have the big thing of, I need to deal with antagonist or major overarching problem or okay. whatever, but you'll just momentarily have this chapter where you're just in something else completely and just, yeah, only tangentially yeah. relating to it. And it's super modular in the sense that like there are a ton like people have been data mining this game now. And there are a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton of variables that will impact what happens. Hmm. Um, and by that I mean like you have the choice of I want to say like six protagonists. And not only does the game know who you're playing as for their scenario, they know how many times you've played through they know how many times you visited this world they know what choices you made before and the scenario can be very different depending on all these little factors hmm. so so the game the, the whole idea uh from like the developers is like we want this every time you start a new game we want the experience to be completely different in some way or other even if you're in the same location you were before um hmm. It's really fascinating. I, I respect um, it. That is ambitious as hell. It's very ambitious, especially because this game definitely... It's hard to tell because it's Square Enix and it's a team that's been there for a while that has respect, but it also looks like if you picture a low-budget video game in your brain, this kind of probably looks like that. Mm. Um, whether it's deliberate or not, it's it's kind of a mystery. Um, I'm going to look this up because yeah, I, what, the problem... What, I'm, th I'm thinking of like trails minus maybe but i'm not familiar with uh with no, really, so. tra trails doesn't have like the big budget or anything like uh like a typical square enix game it has a consistent art style 
and mm -hmm. it delivers on the quality within what it's capable of. Okay. Whereas okay, okay. Emerald Visions, it looks like the character models, yeah, they're 3D and stuff, but they look, there's an almost asset store flip quality to them is the only way I can put it. They look cheap off somehow. Interesting design, especially the way that, you know, scenes and dialogues or whatever will have them posed in certain ways and just yeah i don't it feels again very cheap and yeah there's like very, very limited very yeah like not much animation is happening um except for in combat um but yeah it's, it's very it's very strange it's very it's meant to be like kind of uh i keep going back to this word modular because i can't think of a better word but it's like there's you can tell there's just like flags upon flag upon flags being calculated in the background whenever <laughs> something's happening um and sometimes it can make things like not make a ton of sense right away and i th and i feel like that can be very off-putting uh, especially for like final fantasy people who come in kind of like with different expectations on like what this genre is but for me it's like it's just really interesting to like just sort of ha have this like wash over you and you just kind of like roll with the what the game kind of throws in your face in any given moment um, hmm. especially in this game because it's so like obtuse and, systems and heavy as well yeah and and that extends the to the gameplay or go ahead i was just gonna say that's the thing about like all the saga games are just mm -hmm. yeah they, they've always had like very mixed receptions and varying levels of quality and such but that's never always had a lot of what emerald visions is going for but it just it seems like and again i'm still basing it off what i've seen and the play i've played the demo uh, like the switch yeah. demo that's it so i haven't sat down with the full thing yet but like i am you know i have experience other saga games and yeah they're they're all kind of like this this in its own way and it's very it can be very hard to vibe with it can be very hard to get yeah. in and you really just have to be willing to just kind of bash your head against systems until they make sense for a while and then you go okay this yeah. is kind of neat mm -hmm. And depending on the game, like the rules can be like better or worse explained. And like they're really choosy about which rules they do explain and which ones they don't. Um, like uh, some games will be like, we're not going to tell you how anything works whatsoever. You just figure everything out on your own. Other games are like, well, we'll tell you how this works. But this other system, we're going to really keep close to the chest because it affects so on and so forth. Um, uh, some, some games are like, you can choose your character, but there's still this kind of like, overarching story and the characters still might meet or whatever um or they'll be like no everything's completely separate uh like in this game each character their like scenario is totally different uh so like there's this one gay guy who's like he's like a part of part of the lineage of like a, a japanese family that has like they can control puppets kind of like that one guy in naruto except um and so, like, his whole thing is, like, he's going on this, like, spiritual mission. Whereas, like, there's another scenario where it's, like, you're a little girl, but she's actually an adult witch, but she's pretending to be a little girl uh, to, like, uh, do this, like, uh, coming-of-age ritual thing um, that gets sidetracked. But it's, like, a completely different scenario. There's a lot of cats um, involved in that one. That's the one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then there's one where it's, like, oh, you're a couple of cops uh, who get involved in this like conspiracy and again it's like in a separate location probably a separate world and it's just like the systems kind of unravel in different ways it's just like there's so many ways you could be playing this game and your friend could be playing it and you're having like a totally different experience it's wild uh, except for combat and combat in this game is fucking crazy and it's awesome um it is probably like the most complicated, but like satisfying to dig into turn-based combat system I've ever played. I think it's, I'm comfortable saying that. I think I can second that. It is complex, but when when things line up and you get like the ridiculous chains, you're like, "Ooh, that was kind yeah. of awesome." And then like you mess up, and your enemy gets to do benefit from the same things you can you're like oh no well, yeah, i'm really completely sad. deleted it's like ooh, yeah ooh. absolutely completely deleted so it's like basically there's a timeline um and you can kind of see where your characters and the enemies are on this timeline 
And then you pick a move and it will show you uh, where your character will be on the timeline, which can be different from their default spot. And then it also gives them a little meter underneath them, which is like a second timeline kind of. Um, but it's like a it's like a green bar that can go underneath or to the either side of your character. And if that green bar touches the green bar of another character's move, that turns into a combo. So they are they attack together, they get a little more damage, and depending on another factor, uh, other effects can happen. If you do a big combo, there's a chance that you could uh, proc a. Uh, like a, a second attack, basically, where that group of people will go again. Um, it's like all out or, attack in Persona kind of thing. Yeah, kind of. Um, or if a character is attacking by themselves, but they're super far away from everyone else in the timeline, they'll get to do a showstopper where they just unload all of the action points that are left into whatever is on their move list. And they just blast it out there. Um in the meantime, it's also possible a character will learn a new move randomly, and they will throw it out there in the middle of the fight. Um, or you could have a move that interrupts a different move based on some conditional factor, which can interrupt the enemy combo, or extend your own, or change the timeline some other way. And these things can also happen <laughs> with, with no control on your part. It's like your guy can learn a move in the middle of a combo you planned out, and that will totally disrupt your own combo and make you really upset in the I, moment that should be really exciting. Yeah. <laughs> I th I... And then your enemy gets their combo extended because of that. And it's yeah. like, oh no. And it's like, just. You just had so to stick to the script, bro. You just had to yeah, stick to the script. All you had to do. You just had to get cute about it and you ruined everything. Yeah. Um, I started to think about that, about level ups and like move unlocks in like mm -hmm. a, um, oh, standard Damn RPG what's the, kind of thing. What's the, what's the word for when something is taking place within the world? Diegetic. Yes. I thought I started to think about that diegetically and I'm like, that's so cool. Like, I really like that. Yeah. And I don't know why it's it's just it's been so menu based and stuff that you know to abstract it. I just <laughs> didn't really think about that until like a few years ago. But having like <laughs> having them even learn it like in the middle of battle, just being like, wait a second, wait a second, I just got this idea, guys, check this yeah. shit out. And like, it's and it's that's really the cool. series wide. Yeah. It, the the icon for that is just a light bulb appears over their head, a little noise yeah. plays, and like <gasps> I've got it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's great. What if instead of punching this guy, I kick him? Yeah. I mean, that's literally, like, the, that's literally. Yeah. Like, but that is literally goes. what happened. That, that's, that's and, and my then this one, they make it. That's what happens. <laughs> yes, yeah, it is. And, and this one, they even add a factor where it's like, you can learn a new move or you can learn a modified version of the move you just used. So it's like a, a different tree can can kind of branch out or depending on like your allies, because like there's different mechanics based on who's in your party, like your puppet people, they can't learn new moves on their own, but they can learn moves from other people involved in the battle. Interesting. Or if you're a, a monster, your monster can, if they take out another monster, it's they like can blue learn magic. a move Yeah, I was, I was yeah. just about to say, it's like Kimari from FFT, FF10. Yeah. And then there's robots, and robots, they don't learn moves, but they get moves based on their equipment, which also dictates their stats, which is that really is so weird. Cool. It's, it's like, yeah. there's, there's a lot of interesting things that I've been thinking about lately while playing through Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, and one of, of them is like the way that different Final Fantasy games have imparted mm -hmm. skills onto the player. And mm -hmm. so there's, there's like Final Fantasy IX and Final Fantasy VI, which are like, use this piece of equipment, or something for long enough and then you just get it and you always have it. And then there's yes. like the materia system where it's like, okay, this move is on this thing and you'll have it as long as you have it on, but it'll continue to develop and then you can just give it to somebody else. And then there's mm -hmm. other ones where it's like Final Fantasy X where it's like, okay, these moves are just out there and everybody can access them kind of whenever you just have the right items. And yeah. the idea of having like multiple of those systems in, in, in place game, in a yeah. single game is like really that's so cool i like that it's a lot wild. 
Yeah, it's yeah. like take four Final Fantasies, their individual sub leveling systems. Yeah, put them together, you have a saga. Game. That's yeah. really interesting. I like that a lot. It's wild. And on top of all that, it's still got the thing where it's like, okay, the battle's over now. What? And then like your characters will get random stats will go up. Like, yeah. Oh, this guy's strength went up. This person's health went up. And there's all kinds of other little things. Like, is it there's like even FF2 more and the Dungeon progression. Siege where like if you use a stat it'll get better or is it just, is it yeah. just random um it's both so like okay there will be uh random stat updates um and then there can also be like your skills and a certain weapon will go up um uh, and that's based on use um the moves themselves can rank up based on using them uh so it's just like it's everything it's like everything like certain it is primarily games have... through specific use though yeah can they rank um, down if you don't use like if you switch from bows to axes? Can your if you don't use it for a while, can your bow skill go down? No, it's it's all cumulative <laughs> okay. um, because uh, you also have these things called rolls, and if you get certain moves in different weapons and they come together right, it gives you like a little bonus you can equip. Um, and some people I haven't even gotten to this myself, which says a lot about how much is in this game. But you can like end up like dual wielding certain weapons if you get the right skills. Uh, it's like you have uh, one handed guns, and if you get this skill and this skill, you can learn the guns akimbo uh, role. And if you equip that, then there's specific skills you can learn from that. Which and is not like something that is so typically done. Much inside. stuff. Yeah. Like usually you can you have multiple equipment slots for different weapons, but it's not like you mm -hmm. use them at the same time. It's a case of you can swap between these and you can yeah. only use the moves that are associated with whatever that you have unlocked mm -hmm. and the stats mm -hmm. will go up individually. So it's like, yeah, you can use this in this situation, but if you focus on this, you'll be much better at this. But that then sounds you'll be like a really a really like expanded version of like Final Fantasy Tactics, where it's like if you get mm -hmm. this class to this bit. level and this class to this level, then you unlock like the ninja. And then when you get the ninja, yeah, you get like dual wield, and then you have that, and then it's like mm. you know you can combine and mix and match all of those things to create like something really interesting, like a uh, dual wielding ninja who also has like the samurai ability of like blocking blades and stuff like that. Yeah, but this yeah, sounds like way sure. more involved than any of that. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's like one of the, one of the things I really like about saga games is they sort of like they take RNG. And they sort of combine it with like things that can also go up based on what you have. So you, you're kind of doing this combination of reacting to things you can't control, uh, but like fitting them in with things you can control and building your team that way. And I, I find that like kind of the end result of that is just like a, a team of characters that you you really shape. Um, both based on like effort you put in, but also kind of like, okay, I kind of see where this character might be going in like an emergent way. So let me kind of like roll with that and, you know, see where that takes me and build in that direction. And you might, you might end up with something you maybe weren't thinking about at first, but still is like really neat and powerful at the end. Um, Interesting. And yeah, the characters are usually quite really varied, cool. even in like earlier mm -hmm. saga games, like, just even in something like Romantic Saga 3, which is my go to because it's probably the most like it's probably the most approachable, I feel, mm -hmm. of like the entire saga franchise. But there are characters in that that operate entirely differently from everyone else, or some which, you know, there is one guy you can recruit who is a lobster man. As a result, his armor is always equipped because it's his <laughs> shell. His weapon is always his claws. So he's very good at martial art. And he has water <laughs> magic, which you can't get rid of. And it's like, fuck, all right. Or one character <laughs> is a vampire. So, you know, certain aspects is like they can't replenish their their life points in certain ways, but they have unique magic. And it's just weird shit like that. And well, so, I dig yeah. it. Play yeah. with the box, man. This series is not afraid to be just weird. Even, even yeah. just for the sake of it. It's like, you know, it'd be really silly if we did this. And so they do it. And sometimes it's and... too much. Sometimes it just means... <laughs> you lack coherence you lack understanding yeah. of whatever the hell it's going on like that was how i felt about like saga frontier it's just like it's way too jarring to just be in completely different places and settings and everything it's just like i have 
no through line for this. Yeah, the Emerald Visions sure. kind of does that, but at least it literally has a through line and a thread you follow. And mm-hmm. it's unabashed about how ridiculous it gets. It's like, no, 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 we know this is stupid. Just just, just roll with it. Oh, yeah. And like the localization is really good. And there's just so much like personality to it. Um, and again, like, even if it's like not necessarily telling a story that uh, is either easy to follow or has like a clear like overall arc or anything, it's just like the individual moments are so just either endearing or over the top. Um, like a highlight for me, and then we can kind of move on. There's one, one of the protagonists is a vampire. Uh, but even if you're not playing as him, you can kind of end up in that world doing something else. And there's like the servant lady who's like this goth maid chick. And she's kind of passive the whole time and just kind of following you along and like just sort of like explaining to your guy what's going on. Uh, but there's this part where you're, you're, you're trying to get these items from these wardens of these different like castles. And the guy's like a bat and he's sleeping. And you're just like, oh god, I don't know what to do. We need to wake this guy up. And and your your goth maid chick's like, hold on a second, let me try. And just the background music turns into this like fully vocal like death metal <laughs> track. And like her character <laughs> throws the horns up, and just <laughs> and the lyrics are ridiculous. And you're just like, it's wait, what? Like it. Yeah, why not? yeah, exactly. And the and this, the guy just starts screaming, and 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 then the game continues, and it's, and it's just like stuff like that all just happen out of nowhere, and it's so fun. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know what else to say. There's so much going on in the game, but if, if it's you hard want to, to approach, RPG, but yeah, we know if it's you, hard to approach, but yeah, it's worth at least attempting. I, I think there is uh, a. There's like there's a, a a big ask at the beginning for like kind of being either being okay with being confused or just kind of understanding that like onboarding is gonna be kinda kinda turbulent. But I think the payoff is, is really high um, in a lot of different ways. Yeah. yeah. Sounds cool. I appreciate you talking That's about it. Saga Emerald That's Beyond. So good stuff. Chris, what do you have this week? Uh, let's see. I have been... There's two games I've primarily been playing. Three, actually, but one of them is just World of Warcraft. There's a new season of that. I've been doing that. We've been blitzing through it. You know how it goes. But uh, I don't have much more to say on World of Warcraft than I haven't already, aside from Dragonflight is in a good position, even as it's wrapping up, and the new expansion is looking good. But uh, we'll see. Mostly, I have been playing Inkbound, which... Mm. Uh, Thomas mentioned a couple of weeks back when he was on. And since then, uh, we have been generously provided keys by the developers. Thank you for that, Brian, for arranging that. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, that's uh, that game rules. I fucking love it. <laughs> Straight up. Um, how did Thomas describe it? He described it as something like a mix between Hades and Slay the Spire, I think is what his words were. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Um, that honestly that's a pretty good even if those weren't exactly how he described it that is how i would describe it it has the same kind of feel vibe go back to hub talk to characters etc progress the story kind of thing of hades but then when you go out into combat it's much more turn-based and more yeah obviously it does yeah it it is turn-based you have the class you pick has like a passive and three moves and then you draft a couple of generic moves, and then you modify these moves with uh, boons as you go, items that can change how you play and increase your stats in different ways. And you just progress through these roguelike challenges, determining what your rewards and such will be, progressing a whole bunch of different quests and threads and whatever, and just going through runs. You win, you advance the plot, come back, you lose, that's okay. You still make progress in different things, advance the plot in different ways. And yeah, I I didn't know what to expect going into it, but I quickly found, oh yeah, I dig this. And then I've just been playing a lot of it. It's really good. It's yeah. uh, It has that one more run kind of vibe to it. And mm-hmm. yeah. It's, awesome. um, it's actually been fighting Bellatro for a one more run space. So it's like, there you <laughs> oh, go. There, there, there's, there's the kudos for you. Yeah. I, uh, I'm playing a Weaver 
in the game. Uh, what what class are you playing? Uh, you swap between all of them once you get through uh, the first couple. Um, so there's eight classes in the game, and I've unlocked seven of them. And I played all seven of those in various ways. But uh, the Weaver was the first one to just catch me and go, "Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I really like that mechanic." Yeah. Um, yeah, it, its gimmick is basically threads. Um, funnily, coming right off uh, a <laughs> saga, but um. Yeah, the main attack is you have like a line attack which shoots out like a string or whatever and it connects you you to whatever enemies you hit. Mm -hmm. And so the more enemies you hit, the more effects you have, the more armor and shields you'll get. But that all but they also have to be threaded to connect to uh be hit by the next ability. Your other one, your your two ability is um splits damage evenly, like a set amount of damage evenly between however many threaded, so you can just nuke a single target or space out damage to all of them and yep. depending on how you modify it then may be better to get it on as many people as possible or you may just go no this is a single target nuke yeah and then the other one is um you target one of them and then it's an aoe circle around them and it pulls all of them in together which allows for easier threading so yeah. it's like yep cool. which i yeah that that synergy it was i was like ah interesting very interesting but yeah, and the way yeah. that they they play with you know spatial stuff in a very similar way to like, um, you know, I mentioned earlier like Makai Kingdom or Phantom Brave or um, mm. Trails even, where it's yeah. just like you're you're it's it's you have a limited or even XCOM like you're 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 not limited by a grid in the way that like a lot of um, more strategic uh, RPGs uh, are. Um, yeah, you have a movement circle around your character yeah. that you can extend. Various things will give you additional movement for a turn or whatnot. But it's a case of you can you can move freely, but the mo and you can reset to initial position or whatever to maintain all your movement. But it is just a case of the moment you commit to an action, all the movement you spent to get to that action is used, and then yeah. you can keep the rest for the rest of your turn. And so you just move around as needed. It also has that, yeah. an interesting thing, which is kind of like a wrinkle on Diablo three and Diablo four's like health orb system, where it's like during a fight, like enemies will drop these little, these mm. little power orbs, and so you'll have mm. to also use your movement to go over and grab those to replenish some of your resources and different things like this. Uh, yeah, because grabbing one by default reduces all your cooldowns by one turn. And most of your abilities, aside from your spam, will one have a cooldown, which yep. is very useful. In addition to giving you one more of your will, which is your um, basically actions per turn. Yeah. So you have to balance like, okay, I'm moving around strategically to try to avoid enemy attacks and also get ready to set up my other attacks. But I also need to go and get these orbs. But I also need to make sure that I'm getting these orbs when I need to get them and not when I can't really use them. So it's yeah, yeah and, and it's you good. can set them up because they persist through turns as well. So you can set it up where it's just like, I don't really have much use for it now. I'm just kind of going to go in this completely different direction, dodge. And then next turn, there'll be because the norb spawns every turn. So he's like, okay, I'll grab that, do an attack here, grab that, do another one, da 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 da. And then just line up massive combo. Yeah. It's not, it's not overly complicated, uh, but it does make you think. And plan in a ways that um, a lot of games don't, because a lot of games that control like this, like um, like Assault Android Cactus or whatever, are just they're just real time. So it's like you're not having to plan ahead because everything's just happening and it's all Twitch based. So I think it's it it puts Inkbound in this like interesting space where like it it has this kind of not necessarily like super unique like it's something that nobody ever could have thought about, but like a unique conceit. And then also it has like a wrinkle on several different fused together mechanics from a couple of different games in a way that is, I've don't think I've seen before done this way. Um, and uh, I, I always love it when, you know, things like that appear, you know, like I, I just, my, my review for, or my, my preview for Cla Cataclysmo is up on IGN and in that, like, it's like a tower defense plus like a Lego building game plus like an RTS. And like the previous people, uh, the people, Digital Sun who made this also made Moonlighter, which is like half, 
mm, Legend of Zelda yeah. and half Shopkeep Simulator. And it's like, these are like combinations that I'd never seen before. And so they stick with me longer than, you know, oh, it's Blasphemous, which is basically like Metroid and Dark Souls, but 2D and also Castlevania. And it's like, well, that's not like really like we we have tons of those. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like this has mm. a different vibe and it has this is different... very well presented, but it's well yeah. presented and it goes on like Catholicism and stuff like that, which is like a unique spin on it. But it's not two different genres mashed together, really. Whereas this is like, oh, this is like something I haven't really seen before or haven't seen like hardly at all. So I don't know. I don't know. I yeah, don't know how that speaks to you and and you know Chris, but. Yeah, I dig it because it's uh it has the thing that uh, Into the Breach did as well, which was by the FTL guys. Um, yeah, I know Will would be shouting that out if uh, if he wasn't here. But um, the idea of perfect information it's turn based, but you know exactly what the enemy is going to do, and it's on to you to react. And yeah, that's the case here. You see all the targeting reticles. You see what they're going to do if they'll have like direct lines onto you, and it's a case of you know how much damage you have incoming, so you have to mitigate that either by you know getting shield effects deleting certain enemies crowd controlling or weakening others and positioning yourself in a way to avoid the most uh, telegraphed attacks and so on and it's really interesting how it uh, plays with that and yeah very simple but a lot to consider and a lot of uh, variety yeah i yeah i think it's cool that does sound cool i, I unfortunately <laughs> I was, was kind of busy. The, yeah, I got a key, but I, I was not able to check it out yet. Well, we still definitely want to. That sounds really cool. I will say it is co-op, and I've only played it solo so far due to um, scheduling and such. Yeah. But uh, it so, plays yes. perfectly fine solo, and I'm curious to see how it plays co-op. Honestly, yeah, I would like to, if possible, I would like to have a session where we all play together. But we'll have to see if we can make that happen. Um, For sure, yeah, I dig it. I dig it. And I'm interested in playing more. I've just been trying to wrap up. Uh, I believe I'm in the final area of Final Fantasy VII uh, Rebirth. I'm not sure about that. Might not be true, but I... Who knows? I'm trying to finish some of these games before I, like, dive headlong into other ones. So, it's... Uh, There's a lot of them at the moment. It I'm, is, I'm it working is a time. on it. I'm working on it. But yeah, that's cool. Rebirth's so that's, too big that's, for its own good, I think. Yeah, that's, that's Inkbound. That was Inkbound. Highly recommended. So I'm going to bring something nice. back. Um, uh, yeah. And it's a segment that has not been on this show for a very long time. In fact, I don't think it's ever been on the show since either of you have been hosts. But oh, uh, that's Audrey's Book Corner. Hey. So Ooh. Audrey's Book Corner is a section that we introduced a very, 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 very long time ago where my wife would come Fair on and talk about books that she was reading. Uh, I would ask her what games she had been playing, and invariably she would say, uh, nothing, but I am reading these books, and I'm going to tell you about them. So now, here we go, Audrey's Book Corner. Uh, I've been reading a couple of books, uh, and the first uh, of them is uh, the... I've been reading some Star Wars books. Some expanded universe mm. stuff that has since and you spoke about Thrawn last time. Yes, so I finished. Uh, I finished this. Hold on, I'll be right back. He's coming back with books. Oh. I don't read enough books these days. I get too distracted. I love books. Books rule, but yeah, who has the time for them? All right, uh, so I, I finished I this Thrawn book. Timothy Zahn Thrawn. Thrawn, yep. Uh, this is the new one, which I think is canon now. Uh, it's Disney canon. The other one is still in dubious expanded universe canon. Yeah. So that is by Timothy Zahn. It's quite good. I'm holding it up. And then I started in on some Drew Carpishan books. So this is uh, the Darth Bane trilogy. And I've read the first two of those, which is one of them. Is, the first one is Path of Destruction. And the second one is Rule of Two. And they're both real fun. Uh, there's... Oh, Darth Bane, you are the biggest goddamn jobber in the entire fucking set. Oh, no. Well, I... I yeah, sounds I don't so know. scary. He's not... He's... I, I, haven't read, I haven't read the book. Like, he's not... I'm sure he's a good character and everything in the actual books. But it's like, his entire ideology is just completely fucking stupid and flawed. And 
that's kind of the point. I, I, I will say, uh, I felt that same way until I started reading these books. And then I was like, mm -hmm. okay, I see why you did this. I see why you were, why you went so hard in the paint to, to do that. And I think that if you read it, I think, um, I think you'll, I think you'll, you'll see the same thing. And now I have not finished it. I've only read the first two. I, I'm still waiting on the third one to come in from the library. But while I'm waiting on that one, uh, I'm reading these, the original, uh, the original Thrawn trilogy, hey. which is, uh, starts with heir to the empire. And then right now I'm about halfway through dark force rising. Uh, and I've got the last command, uh, over there, which I'm going to get to afterwards. Um, but I remember adoring those books, but I haven't read them since fuck. I was still in high school. So it's a while. Yeah. But anyways, yeah, these are, these are all real good. And then I'm also reading a not star Wars book. Uh, it just came out. It's by Terry Hayes. It's called year of the locust. Um, Terry Hayes Ooh. wrote, I am pilgrim, which is another great, like spy thriller. Um, that might be spy might not be the right word, but definitely like, you know, um, the I am pilgrim is like a anti-terrorist thriller to like counter terrorist thriller. This one is like a spy thriller. That's also like counter terrorist. Um, but mm -hmm. I'm enjoying it. It's really good. It is graphic. So, uh, faint of heart need not apply. <laughs> They describe some pretty heinous things that are happening uh, that the villains are doing and these sorts of things. So pretty brutal. On the scale of one to Mortal Kombat 1, how graphic? Oof. I have not played Mortal Kombat 1, but probably like a 7 or 8. Okay. So bad by yeah. real life uh, oh, yeah, standards. Yeah, yeah but not like supernatural type of stuff. It is fiction, but it is, it is, uh, it is grounded Heavy in a going. way that can be very disturbing at times. So, mm. uh, so, but yeah, but it's quite, it's quite good. Quite good. And that's all I really had. So I don't know if, if you guys wanted to talk about anything else or if we wanted to dip out and keep it at a slim hour. No, I still got one more game. Um, right. but how about you, Lucas? Uh, I got one more I could do as well. Uh, Let's see yours first, and I'll wrap it up on that. Sure. Okay, that works, because this morning was the embargo lift. Um, hey. So, uh, a game that I really liked, and I think Will also really liked at PAX, called Heading Out. Uh, it was a sort of, it's like a roguelike, it's also a driving game. Uh, that's this very will segue much... nicely into the game I'm talking about. Go on. Ooh. Oh, yeah, um, okay. got it. Yeah, it's, it's sort of like it's built on the backbone of like uh, 70s, 80s, like Americana sort of counterculture stuff. So like uh, very, very heavily inspired by like Vanishing Point. Um, also, you can see a lot of like Jack Kerouac and stuff in bullets. Um, basically, the premise is you're like this mysterious driving person who uh, has a really cool jacket and they are on the run from basically the physical manifestation of their own fears and regrets. And they are attempting to, well, I'll take a step back. They're, they're basically on this sort of unexplained drive to uh, race a mysterious person who is, is noted at first as like the greatest driver ever or whatever. You're just sort of like, mysteriously compelled to like drive across the country and, and, and face off with this person while while your demons are chasing you. So the the brunt of the gameplay is like you have a atlas of the country and all the the routes through each state are kind of on the board and in a line and your car just kind of like drives across uh, while like there's a big evil red line chasing you that branches uh so it will try to like flank you basically and you have a limited amount of money and gas and a wanted meter 
And as you kind of travel, you can stumble across random events. Uh, you can be challenged to races by random people. Um, police might stop you. All kinds of weird stuff can happen. Um, and then when you reach a destination, it's usually like a pit stop between states or whatever, you can choose to refuel, you can choose to rest, you can buy something, um, you can, once again, encounter some kind of scenario, and then you kind of keep going. Um, and basically, whenever you end up in some kind of challenge situation, whether it's uh, needing to avoid the police or accepting a race or getting a little too close to the stuff you're running away from, it'll shift to a driving section where it's almost kind of like a need for speed with a little bit of crazy taxi. Um, and it's got these, this like really intense, like it's not quite arcadey. It's got a little bit of like chunkiness to it, a little bit of like driving some, not too much. So you can still kind of get weird. Uh, and like whip your car around the stuff. But if you crash, uh, you can very easily crash in a way that's fatal. Um, Just like real and life. You have... Exactly, exactly. Except you can revive a few times in this one. Um, and yeah. basically, little, as you're as you're life, driving life across hack. the country, don't crash your car. Yeah, don't don't run into things on and expect to keep you know going where you're going. Just doesn't work out that way. Um, but as you go, like you can, you know, your your fatigue will increase. Uh, the condition of your car will get worse. Um, you know, your 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 money will go away. Um, and so you are fighting tooth and nail to get to your destination. Um, you might start falling asleep behind the wheel. Uh, you might have you might run out of money, and you'll have to go into like additional police chases if you can't pay for your gasoline uh, all this kind of stuff if, if you make it to the end you have your showdown against the mysterious best racer ever or your racer run X, ends clearly. <laughs> exactly and at the end of your run you get sort of this like summary of your story of that point and it combines like all the decisions you made, like you, you'll get into these different encounters that are like many stories. Like, uh, there's one where it's like this: you you come across this man and his his uh, elderly mother, and he's like taking her across the country as she's like dying, and uh, they're out of money, but he's got her meds, and you can choose to like pay for her meds, and it's like something that'll help you stay awake on the road, or you can just give them money, or you can ignore them entirely, and it affects your reputation. Blah blah blah. Uh, but it kind of lays out like this is the the story your person built. Here's their reputation and how that affects the overall story. Here's like your driving skills and how your races and stuff went, and it all kind of smushes that together into a little summary and then like a title for your driver. And it's like this is the uh, this is your character, um, and it's like it's all black and white and two D drawings, very like. European indie comics, which is kind of ironic since it's all America y. Um, and then, like, each run you complete, uh, more different kinds of challenges will come up, so it just gets more complicated. And uh, eventually, if you get through four runs in a row, you actually get like the ending of the overall story and everything. Um, and, and it's really interesting because it's got these like roguelike affectations to it, but and it makes you kind of think the stakes are really high. But at the same time, it really feels like it's trying really hard to, like, give you multiple opportunities to not, like, immediately fail your run. Like, you you know, you've got your revives if you're really bad at driving. But, like, every race you have a full set of revives. It's not like you get four for the run and that's it. It's like every time you race, you have four revives. So you get to get to the end no matter what. And if you run out of money... You, you know, you have to run away from the police, but it's never like, oh no, you're out of money. I guess your, your run's over. Sorry. Or like if runs your fears catch game, up. Yeah. yeah, exactly. If your fears catch up, you get a chance to evade them to get a little extra. Like it's, it's very lenient and there is difficulty settings, which is like, you know, that's taboo for road likes. You can't have difficulty settings except for here. Um, so it's like really trying to like push you along on the overarching story at the same time. And it does do the like 
this is your character. It does that every act. So even so like if you if you fail, it gives you that, but also if you win, it still gives you that. It's just like a more complete version of it and then you get to do it multiple times. But then there's still just the overall story. So it's it's like it uses roguelike stuff almost as like a like a vibe machine. So it's like it's effective and make it, it's almost like in a the Walking Dead where it like pretends that your choices matter more than they do and it like makes yeah. you kind of like it like tricks you emotionally into like believing it. I think that's kind of what it's doing here. Which I think is interesting, especially like it's all in the context of like a driving game. So it's like driving game, but story with choices and sort of like all not I don't want to say fake all the way, but kind of disingenuous roguelike stuff to make you kind of feel like the stakes are higher just to like get your heart rate pumping a little more and uh, it all it all like kind of like smushes together into this like interesting little package hmm. um, and I was all ready to be like, oh this game is awesome and I love it but there's like two things that really just like nagged at me a lot and one of them is that like it does these like radio skit things um and it's basically just like radio skits from grand theft auto but in this setting and it just doesn't work for me at all yeah it sounds like Um, that'd be a bit of a vibe clash exactly it's just like you're 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 having all these like pretty like serious or at least intense like story moments and gameplay moments and then like the radio comes on and it's like fake Glenn Beck ranting about the liberals <laughs> or, or, you know, some lady just saying a bunch of stuff that's absurd just to be funny. And like, normally it's like, Oh, that's funny. I get it. It's nonsense, but it's like, you know, it, that only all of a sudden I'm playing Stain Row or whatever. Is. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, they kind of try to, have y'all seen vanishing point? Mm-mm. I don't think so. Okay. So basically, like, the plot of Vanishing Point is this guy's, like, a driver, and he's taken on this, like, cross-country delivery, and he's, like, decided he's just, like, fed up with the world and the cops and the systems and everything. So he's just just driving as fast as he can, forget the rules, he's going to get there, and then, like, the cops are trying to take him out and everything. And along the way, there's this radio jockey that, like, picks up on the guy's story. He's basically, like, cheering this guy on the whole time. And it's almost like a, like a, like a, proxy for the audience it's like yeah like you know stick it to the man driver guy and it's like they started going for that here but then they were like but also let's do grand theft auto jokey stuff instead um and i think that really misses the mark and like it really slows the game down like every time you do a race for example like before it loads back to the map you have to like sit there and listen to a whole radio skit and just really clashes like you said chris um and then the other thing is like i think i just have issues with where the story goes overall like i think it goes to a conclusion that's kind of obvious when you sit down in front of it and just sort of ends in like a like a cliche kind of way um and a way that kind of like undermines the way the game has been playing up to that point Hmm. and i wish i could be more explicit but it's like spoilers or whatever. Spoilers, but, yeah. 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 Basically that's that's kind of where it is with heading out. It's like a really interesting collection of interesting pieces that are fit together in a fascinating way. Uh with a really cool vibe, really like in the review I kept saying it's like an academic level understanding of like the media that's like inspired by. Um you could tell like the writers like have read all of these books and watched all of these movies and then some and pulled that into like the story they're telling. Um, so it's like really like really intensely well understood and sort of reproduced uh, like media study kind of thing um, with a couple of little drawbacks, but like, I know, I know Will is really into it as like a car guy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, He's a sick yeah, I think it's a thing. He is. He mm-hmm. is an absolute sicko. And Disgusting. I know. Just, just full on degenerate. Whose mm-hmm. opinion I think I really want to hear about how, how the story goes. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it's, it's a fascinating game. I, I gave it an eight. Uh, so I still really liked it, despite my couple of problems with it. Um, yeah, I, I am not really a car person, um, although I do love Vanishing Point a lot. Uh, 
but it's just a really, really interesting game. And it's not it's not like one of those roguelikes where it's like, okay, well, I guess I could better get good at this, or I won't be able to see it through. It's kind of a lot more finds a good sweet spot. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, that's heading out. It's it's a cool game. Nice, good stuff. I think it's also the first game that Sabers put out since they escaped the Embracer Group. So like, shout outs to Saber for that. Yeah. Oh man. The Embracer situation <laughs> is another one we could touch on if we wanted to go current events. But like, Let's save that for next week because there's more to get yeah. into than we have time for. Yeah, so allow me to then uh, regale you with tales of my own roguelike driving game, uh, Pacific Drive. I'll put some more time oh, yeah. into that since uh, first introducing it. So when mm-hmm. I introduced it, I had about two hours in when it. When it now rains, I it pours with the car sickos, it seems. Seriously, it's, it's remarkable. It's like, two of the same similar style but completely different like aesthetic and approach it's just like out at the same time go figure yeah but uh yeah i'm maybe maybe 20 hours or so into pacific drive now and i'm still not like that far in terms of story and such because a lot of it is it is run based so Mm -hmm. there'll be situations where it's like i'm just scrounging for materials i'm trying to do repairs for other failed runs and there's a lot of um it has a lot of uh Again, like previously we spoke about, you know, friction in game design in regards to like Dragon's Dogma and such. It has a lot of friction um, in mm. a good way, though. Like everything is a process. Like when you get in your car, you have to turn the key. You then have to put it in gear. You have to manually switch on wipers or headlights or things like that. And, um, and these will then have effects like your wipers and your headlights drain your battery. So mm. you'll need to recharge your battery if you uh, keep them on too long. You can keep them on when you get out of the car, which will continue to drain the battery and things like that. So, yeah. And then, you know, you have to maintain your fuel. You run out of fuel, you got to go find more fuel. There's stuff which you can siphon from old cars and that are still intact or old gas stations or whatever. You have a jerry can in the back, which you can also fill with fuel. And so you take that with you and go fill that up and everything. And all the while you're doing all this, gathering materials from, like, abandoned... Uh, buildings research labs and such in this area which has basically you know fallen into what's the best equivalent like it's again it's very um a roadside picnic sh- a stalker shadow of chernobyl kind of feel um mm-hmm. but yeah you're basically in the area which they just call the zone in which there's all sorts of weird anomalies and it's you know it seems to not like you so every what's interesting is that most of um there's enemies per se but they're everything that is is portrayed almost like hazards or traps rather than actual like antagonistic enemies or anything like that like for example there's ones that are just um there's uh crash test dummies that do the whole um weeping angel thing from doctor who again so you know you know you know look at them and then they'll just move around and just just stand there or whatever but if you go and poke them or drive over them they just blow the fuck up and so (laughs) you have to uh yeah you have to like throw a flare at them or shoot a flare gun or something um Mm. or just try and avoid them which is annoying because you know they'll just pop up right next to you when you're not expecting it It was just like get out of here other times there's like looks like random collections of junk with a magnet hanging down called abductors if they spot you or your car they'll just latch on and drag you for a bit and yeah so it's like i hope you're in the car put on the brakes if you're not in the car that's gonna hurt so i hope you have healing kits and so on but uh and then there's other things which are just like just giant buzz saws which just pass back and forth through the ground or area or like little electrical transformers that are just shooting in between each other and create fields and hazards and such towers which you know are basically red alert tesla coils so don't get too close so you get zapped Lots of little hazards and things, but none of them, it, it's, yeah. And then there's a lot of anomalies, which are also feel like they can be benign. There's some which are just like weird. It's It looks like a tree that's made out of um, amps and speakers, like music instruments and such. But you go in that area and it just repairs your car. And so like, well, that's great. And yeah, so you're kind of navigating these semi-roguelike, areas where you're driving through trying to scrounge as many resources as you can and either progress as far as you can through into new areas and 
advance the plot, advance the story or whatever, or just, you know, basically open a gateway where which causes an instability storm to rapidly close in and just start shredding everything. So you have to mm-hmm. drive really quickly to the point of escape while, you know, the conditions get worse and your car starts to corrode. And which at, at the end you just teleport right back to the to the auto shop, which is basically your hub, and then you repair each part, you craft new parts, you replace them. And again, it's a process. The whole thing is a process in which you really have to just you end up crafting multiple like doors and panels for your car, some of which you'll just will be situational. It's like, oh, I'm going into a really high electrical thing. Cool. I'll replace them with insulated panels which have higher resistance to that. Or yeah, I'm going really far into radiated zones, radiation protection. Or I just want, you know, a, a quick milk run down the road or whatever. I'll just use the shitty ones just to go get as many scrap materials as possible and then come back and make newer ones. So that's the kind of rhythm you have. You go out, you scout, you scrounge, you find logbooks and more weird shit that's going on as the anomalies kind of change and grow and do weird stuff. While also just, you know, getting radio logs and such or radio transmissions from people who are still in the zone. There's a couple of people who have just remained and learning more about that all while you're trying to get deeper in to find a way out or find mm-hmm. the mystery of what the hell the zone is and what's going on. And it's, it's really compelling. It's got incredible vibes, just very atmospheric, very tense. And even though often it feels like a lot of the hazards aren't like actively malicious or trying to get in just things you can navigate the whole process of it means i'm always kind of on edge and weird complications Mm -hmm. will come in and then it's like every time that happens it's like there is a process i have to go deal with that and so many little systems just add to that like your car is kind of sentient so it will develop quirks over time Mm. And you have to, de- you, and then you'll have to develop, you have to diagnose these quirks in order to <laughs> fix them. <laughs> but uh, yeah, like for example, I have one that keeps popping up and it's um, whenever my headlights are on and I start turning left, the headlight starts to dim. So I have to make a real turn that I'll just be in pitch darkness for a while. So I just have to kind of stop the turn, let the lights just flick back on. Or other times it's like your lights are on, your uh, speedometer is just spinning in circles. Sometimes they can be hazardous or real pains in the ass. Other times it's just mild inconveniences, but you always have to like, you have to watch out for them, correctly identify what is the cause, what is the effect, put that in the machine to actually identify it. And it's like, cool, now you can fix it if you don't want it, or you just deal with it. And mm. at the moment, my car is fucking haunted. It has like seven quirks and only two of them. I can <laughs> physically notice what they do. I was like, what the hell is Come this? On. So <laughs> it's, it gets, it gets fucking wild, but uh, yeah, it's just, it's, it's really compelling. And I'd be playing more of it if I want, I was, I'm streaming it for a couple of friends. So it's like, I only mm. have certain amounts mm. of time where I can play it, but otherwise I'd be playing a lot of it. It's, it's really cool. I, I want to see more. I want to find out what else kind of bullshit anomalies they have. There's like three areas of the zone. Like there's basically each one has a wall around it and they had to keep building new walls as the zone kept expanding beyond it. And so I can assume each one just gets worse, more unstable and so on. And I'm still in the outer one. Like I fully explored that as much as I can, but I'm still, I haven't gone as deep as I can go. And I'm really curious to see what, what's on the other side and how, how bad shit it gets. So yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. A little, a little, uh, little echoes of like attack on Titan or the last of us part two or something like that. Kind of. Yeah. Where it's just like, Oh, you're going to get to this. You're going to get to this containment section is like, no, this is awful, man. That also yeah. reminds me. There was a, there was a comic that I was, uh, reading about where it's like a brother and sister pair who rode bikes into this like forbidden zone. Oh my god, that's gonna drive me nuts that I can't think of the name of that. It's probably inspired by Roadside Picnic because everything seems to be. Basically, what happens is the the brother and the sister go in, uh, and like something something gets attached to one of them on the way out. So then they've got like this dark figure that can just like alter the laws of physics and reality, and they take it outside beyond like the like restricted zone and now it's like this whole thing anyways 
It was really good. It's a bummer that I can't Sounds remember it. it. Yeah. But yeah, uh, that's Pacific Drive, and I want to play more of it, and I want to hear what Will has to say, because I know he picked it up. I just don't know if he's got around to it yet. But uh, yeah. I think this will be like the third time or the fourth time that we've talked about this game on this show. Sounds really cool. Yeah. Is it like a cumulative kind of thing, where like you go out and you kind of like fill in parts of the map, and then you know things yeah, go poorly, kind and you of. kind of just go back, or... Um, it all seems to be like mostly roguelike generated. So the area will change a little bit, but, um, you have map markers or whatever, and it's like in certain areas, there'll be certain Mm -hmm. effects and, um, yeah. And so certain areas will have more materials of one particular kind or whatnot. So you kind of get a feel for knowing what to look out for. It's like, I really need this one thing to get this upgrade or go to this place and it's likely to have what I need. And then the more you explore it, the more you can kind of bypass certain areas. Like there's mm-hmm. one where it's just like, I can just almost drive like down a freeway and then just end up like two, three areas ahead because I've cleared the way effectively. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. while the layout will change, you kind of identify the roads and how it's probably going to go and get a, get a feel for it. And there's times where you can just drive on through real quick, but you're usually encouraged because you need energy in order to teleport back. You're usually encouraged to at least, you know, go, eh, that anchor's kind of on the way. I'll swing by that and grab that. And then, oh, what's this? Oh, the, you know, and gotcha. all sorts of hazards and such. So it's, it's really compelling. But um, yeah, I don't think it's like a set map that you don't fully come to understand absolutely everything. And the anomalies at such change within each time anyway. So mm. it's like, mm, yeah. So you learn okay. you learn how to navigate around specific anomalies and to kind of prepare for it. So in the early days, for example, I had like shitty tires and then I got off road tires and I was like, oh, I see a tower. I don't have to go up and risk my health in order to break it. I just go around, just you know, drive through a couple of trees or whatever, no problem. Case in point, I knock over a couple of trees like that. <laughs> Thanks, Taco. <laughs> stuff over in the background. So, so you're kind of like upgrading your car over time. So there's like a yeah, meta yeah. progression element. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, the energy you gather to teleport can also be used to unlock new blueprints, which can either improve your home base to facilitate what you can do, what you can unlock to make certain aspects of your life easier, or to unlock new parts or to your car, or to give you the character when you get out more resistance and so on. So yeah, it's very survival game in that you're always scrounging for materials in order to further extend the tech tree but uh Mm -hmm. yeah and there is that cumulative aspect to it but it's uh yeah it's pretty good cool nice yeah good stuff but i think that's about it for me this week so yeah yeah let's get out of here let's call it a wrap Thank you for joining us for episode 311 of the Platformers Podcast. I'm going to seduce you now as we go away for the for the week. Hey, it's just me. Don't worry about it. It's nothing weird. It's just me talking in your ears. Audiobooks, baby. Get into them. Find them at your local Platform library. Platform ASMR. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, anyways, thanks for uh, thanks for hanging out with us for this episode. Really appreciate it. Maybe I should get into ASMR. Is there an ASMR OnlyFans, or is that is that always the vibe? Is just ASMR is just always like on the fringes of sexuality. I suppose it really depends. If, if you are, I suppose you have. It depends on whether or not you are Logan Cunningham from Supergiant Games or the um, the narrator from Disco Elysium. At that point, it's just always on for you. You know. Yeah, I'm I'm reading people an audio book just with a raging erection, <laughs> <laughs> and just you can tell because the of the way that you can, and you can tell because of the way that I'm talking. Yeah, <laughs> but anyways, yeah, no, but anyways, yeah. How did we this get is, here? This is a I I veered we, much like the driving games. I veered so hard off the road that it just you well. Know, this is anomalous, all right. Yeah, so we crashed into several almost, trees. Almost made it to the end. Almost made it to the end without any yeah. sort of perversion, but you know. Anyways, 
uh that's that's about it yeah like i said um if you want to see where i am you can find me at ribnax r-i-b-n-a-x at uh on twitter you can find me at blue sky and backlogged at brian barnett b-r-i-a-n-b-a-r-n-e-t-t and if you want to see the stuff that i've been writing uh my skater gator feature is up on ign right now where i sat down with um a director level developer on that project from weathered sweater and uh, Sunday month, um, <clears throat> Ryan Huggins. So that conversation is up, including like my thoughts of Skater Gator and my uh, Digital Sun Cataclysmo uh, preview is up on IGN. You can check out the video. It's like a little brisk, little seven minute video preview over on YouTube. Just search Cataclysmo IGN and uh, you'll be able to find it. I had a lot of fun playing it and uh, it's real good. So. I can't imagine, based on the way that uh, their previous two outings uh, launched, I can't imagine this game being anything less than excellent when it comes out in the uh, full release. So, Lovely. Hell yeah. Yeah, that's me. Chris, where are you at? I am at my website, versusthebacklog.com, vstabacklog.com, one word. You can find me on uh, socials and most video games as Delphi, D-E-L-F-E-I-R. Say hi to me if you see me around. Uh, yeah, Hi, Chris. Not a lot going on. Hi. Not a lot going on in the terms of writing and such, but uh, it's it's a work in progress, so stay tuned. How about you, Lucas? Uh, you can find me on socials at Hokutono Lucas. Um, and my writing is generally at shacknews.com. Uh, we had the heading out review, went out this morning, uh, despite my best efforts at not remembering embargoes. Um, and then I've got something going up tomorrow morning. And probably we'll probably, probably come after that. Next week. Yeah. Nice. Some some really cool stuff coming out this month. It was it was looking kinda kinda dire for a minute, but uh cool stuff is coming through anyway. And now Hades 2 dropped into early access today, and I'm gonna go play that as soon as we're done here. So nice. Well we better get out oh, of yeah. here. But yeah. I'll just, with that, I will say, konbanwa, because I've been learning Japanese. Uh I was going to say, I was going to say, dozo yoroshiko, but I, I already know everybody here. So (laughs) anyways, have a great night. Uh, From everybody here at the platformers, we hope you have a wonderful week and stay safe out there because until next time, we are out. Peace.